So Dave, if you want to. Okay, so the meeting is being recorded since the only ones that are being seen are, are us, are Sharon and myself. I'm assuming nobody else has issues with that. Um, if you do, you can of course just watch the recording. But we want to thank all of you for being here. We I'm gonna share my PowerPoint. We started these, of course, when the pandemic hit and we could no longer all meet in person. And they seem to be being very popular. Um, Sharon, I believe, is one of our most popular. Start, yes, yeah, start my slideshow. Okay, so thank you. I'm with Ride Illinois, and I'm, my name is Gina Kenny. I'm our projects and communications coordinator. Dave Simmons, who you heard, uh, is our executive director, and we are thrilled to have Sharon Kamenecki tonight. Before I introduce her, I just want to tell you, most of you are probably familiar with us, but for those of you who are not, we are your statewide nonprofit bicycling advocacy organization. So basically, I'm going to start with the bottom. We're trying to make Illinois better through biking. So we do that in a variety of ways. We advocate for bike-friendly roads, more trails and improved trails, favorable legislation and policies, uh, education, not just to cyclists, but also to motorists, so we can all safely share the road, as well as we want to just share our love of cycling with others. So you have two thirds of our staff on the webinar with you this evening. As I said, Dave Simmons is our executive director. There's me on my mountain bike, and then Ed, who uh, some of you may know as our previous executive director, we have been very lucky to keep him on with us part time. We didn't let him retire completely. So Ride Illinois being a not-for-profit, um, the way we're able to do our advocacy work is through memberships. So through all of our individual members, um, which are so many that we can't list here, but also through our corporate members. So these are individuals, uh, bike clubs, as well as businesses that help us uh, provide webinars like this and everything else. I do want to make sure you're all aware of our bike safety quiz. Please promote this to everyone. And what's wonderful about this is if you give someone a pamphlet, they're not real likely to read it. But if you take the quiz, if you get the answer right, you continue. There's not much on there. But if you get it wrong, it explains why it is incorrect. So it's, you know, most people usually find something that they weren't quite so sure about. A somewhat new initiative is our Ride Illinois community. Basically, we wanna make sure that our organization is welcoming to everyone. We don't wanna just be for road cyclists, mountain bikers, e-bikers or anyone. We want everyone in Illinois that rides a bike to feel connected to our community. So there's some information here and we have more information on our webpage about it. So as I mentioned, uh, most of our advocacy work is because of the donations, uh, the memberships that we have, the ways you can support us. Again, I'm gonna start at the bottom. We would love for you to become a Ride Illinois member, but we know um, even if you cannot, we want you to just ride as much as you can for both recreation and transportation, follow the rules of the road. You know, Whenever you're on a bike, you are basically an ambassador for our entire community, good or bad. Um, promote our organization to your friends and families. We try to be a great resource for everyone. Mentioned our bike safety quiz. Share your suggestions and concerns um, about local issues and even about upcoming webinars you may want to see. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. As I said, become a member. So this is our contact info. You can also, you can find our contact info on our website. You can reach out to us through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. So we try to make it as easy as possible to speak to you guys. Some ground rules, basically, as I've mentioned a few times, share comments and questions in the chat. Um, it's helpful if you send it to panelists and attendees. Um, the Q and A, we will try to see as well, but if we don't get to your question, the chat is saved. And again, um, the link to this recording will be shared within the next day or so, probably by tomorrow. 
So that is all I am going to stop sharing and I'm going to let Sharon. So Sharon is a bike shop owner and uh, our earth cycle. Earth rider. Earth rider, I'm so sorry. Uh, she's also a league certified instructor to the League of American Bicyclists. She's been involved in Chicago bicycling for a long time. I believe you're also involved with one of the local bike clubs. Yeah, Huddleston Bike Club, Chicago Cycling Club. Yeah. I thought it was more than one. So I am going to let Sharon take it away. I do have your presentation downloaded just in case we have any technical glitches. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Gina. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, share the knowledge about uh, e-bikes. Um, I like to say that when you're riding an e-bike, it feels as if you have superhero legs and an e-bike gives you the power to pedal or not. Um, so here's a little bit about what we're going to, I was planning to talk about, but before we get started, I wanna ask Gina to um, launch the poll. Yes. Um, so, um, I have a lot of things I can talk about, but I just wanna understand who's here. Um, so I wanna know whether you are, are you currently own an e-bike um, or if you've uh, ridden an e-bike, you know, either through the Divi bike share or some um, out of state bike share cap, um, you know, Washington DC has e-bikes and so does New York City. Or, or if you've never ridden one, you're just interested in learning more. So if you could um, and answer we're the question. About two thirds have responded. I'll give it a little bit more time. And I appreciate that you read it because that is the one thing on the recording that nobody will see the poll. So I will also, um, we're at 70%. We'll give you a little bit more time to give us your answer. And then I will share the results with everyone. I'm going to give it just a couple more seconds. Okay, I'm going to end polling and share results. So you can see, but for those watching this later, 27% uh, said I have the boost. I own an e-bike. 22% said experience the boost. I've ridden an e-bike. And 51%, so more than half, are interested in the boost and want to know more about e-bikes. Okay, stop sharing and turn it back over to you. Okay, so remember that story about the old codger who told his grandkids that when he was their age, he walked to school and the route was uphill both ways. Well, with an e-bike, you feel as if you're going downhill both ways. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. Here's the agenda I was planning to talk about. What's an e-bike history, the benefits, something about the unique hardware, the legal um, aspects, the downsides, the future, and I have a small quiz at the end. So just a little bit about myself. Uh, Gina told you a little bit about this is me. Uh, I'm Sharon Kamenecki. I live in the Logan Square neighborhood of Chicago and, and I own the Earth Rider Cycling Shop, which I opened three years ago. It's in Bucktown on the Northwest side of Chicago. I'm a retired IT project manager. My first foray into bicycle retailing was a bike shop and hotel in Broadhead, Wisconsin. And I'm a league cycling instructor, certified mechanic. And I'm an ambassador for cycling. So first question is what's an e-bike? So lots of different definitions, but the one I like is the simplest one. It's a standard bicycle with the addition of a motor, a battery, and a display to assist, and these, these items assist propulsion. Um, also, some people define a bicycle as a bicycle with a boost. And so a little chart on the bottom, which shows the growth of, there's various different numbers you see about the growth in e-bikes, but um, they're, they're pretty popular around the world. So a little bit about the history of e-bikes. It goes back to 1895 when the first patent by Ogden Bolton Jr. Uh, um, he had a patent for a battery powered bike. Um, and there were some other patents in the area um, some other pedelecs they were called, and here's another one from 1932. So, um, so there's been an interest in putting a little propulsion on a, e on a bike for a long time. So here's like a basic history of e-bikes um, in the gross area. Um, uh, e-bikes 1.0 was like from 1889 to 2005. Uh, e-bikes sort of like as we know them today, they began, began mass production in China, um, they were, they issue, uh, contained a motor triggered by pedaling. There was no throttle. 
Um, they were primarily lead acid and NICAD, NICAD batteries, and they weighed about 80 pounds. Um, it was during this period that Lee Iacocca, I have his picture over there, he formed a company to design and market electric vehicles, and he introduced the EV Global Bike in 1999. It had a steel frame, hardtail suspension fork, and a C post, 36, 36 bolt, a horn, a light front disc brake, 20 mile range, 15 mile per hour max. It had a Heisman brushed motor from Germany with steel gears, sealed lead acid battery, and it cost about $1,000 to $1,300. So it's kind of ahead of its time, but um, didn't quite take off at that time. So uh, e-bikes um, 2.0 was like between 2005 and 2015, where the motor in a hub drive was introduced. And Bionics is one of the companies that introduced it. Um, these models mostly used existing frames, and there were uh, tremendous advances in lithium iron batteries uh, sensors and controls during this period. And then uh, 3.0 is kind of the area, era we are in today, uh, starting at about 2015, when the big players started to move in, and it was the introduction of the Bosch drive. We'll talk a little bit more of that later. There's, there have been tremendous breakthroughs with batteries, uh, more capacity and lighter um, integration with other components. Um, and I did a quick review of electric bike review. They, today, they list 231 vendors of e-bikes in, um, in their little review situation. Um, and each of these vendors would have maybe several models as well. So there's a lot of different types of e-bikes out there. So Sharon, I'm gonna interrupt with a quick question. Rick wants to know if there's a difference between an e-bike and an electric bike. No, it's the same. Yeah, e-bike is just shorthand for electric bike. <laughs> Thought so, but I thought you're our expert. I'd let you manage. Okay. So I just want to talk some about the why would you be interested in having an e-bike? And here's some of the advantages. An e-bike provides a workout. Um, it it, um, it let, allows you to get someplace with, uh, arrive less sweaty and exhausted. It allows you to haul a heavy load. Here have a picture of a kids, or you can um, um, carry some cargo or groceries. Um, it, you can vary the ride from day to day. Um, it gives you a sense of um, uh, knowing exactly when you would arrive for an appointment, although this is also true with a bike. Um, you know, you can, as you know, as cyclists, we can, we can uh, whiz by other cars that are stopped at stoplights, you know, on the right-hand side. So um, that's also true. Um, you can ride with a faster friend and keep up with them. Um, an e-bike allows you to reduce auto trips and it enables physical activity even with limitations as people may have a little hip problem or knee problem, um, have trouble with a regular bike. Um, they might find that e-bike gives them a little more opportunity to uh, be outdoors and it extends biking into the colder months. I uh, wanted to comment on that. In New York City, the city bike ridership, uh, which is their ride share, decreases by 60% from October to February. Uh, but interestingly enough, e-bike use during this period held firm. And so that indicates that the quicker journey times and the ease of use could be enough to make winter commuting realistic for a greater number of cyclists. So e-bikes also help the environment. People with e-bikes make fewer trips by car. Um, and I have some citations there. I have I have, there's references to articles that back this up. Each male bike, instead of driving, keeps one pound of greenhouse gas emissions from the atmosphere. It's a lower impact than public transportation. And cycling friendly nations have seen bikes outnumber cars and have seen e-bike sales arise. Um, a healthy activity that's fun or fun that's healthy. Um, um, some recent information is the current uh, administration, the Biden administration is addressing climate change and e-bikes are something that could contribute to achieving that. Um, oops, see right there for a minute. On February 9th, Congressman Jimmy Patina, um, Democrat from Carmel Valley and Congressional Bike Caucus Chairman Ed Earl Blumenauer uh, from Oregon introduced the Electric Bicycle Incentive Kickstart for the Environment. And it just happens to spell out e-bike. Um, and this act is designed to encourage the use of electric bikes or e-bikes through a consumer tax credit. Uh, due to the distance, speed, and ease, ease by which they can travel, e-bikes will help replace vehicle trips and commutes and reduce carbon emissions. That's their thinking. 
Um, and so this is um, this legislation has been in, uh, introduced, and I guess they're waiting for some um, for it to be uh, discussed or whatever. It's going through the process. Um, they're they're talking about through this legislation. They're talking about a tax credit um, to individuals that purchase e-bikes. So different types of e-bikes. Um, there's the classic hybrid. It's prioritizing power to accelerate from being stopped in traffic range. Um, it has a range to, to commute farther with less effort and, the, and, and it's a weight of such that helps you get in and out of an apartment. The road bike is optimized battery range and overall weight to replicate the feel of a road bike and a mountain bike um, designed higher torque to conquer steep and technical climbs, allowing access to more descents with less effort. So those uh, are the- Karen, sorry, can, can you repeat again the uh, Congress people that are doing, that sponsored the bill before you get too far ahead? Thank you. The, con the Congressman Jimmy Patena, is that what you're talking about? The e-bike legislation? Yes. Yeah, um, it's called the uh, e-bike. Uh, electric bicycle incentive kickstart for the environment, and it was introduced by Jimmy Panetta, Panetta, P-A-N-E-T-T-A, -E and Earl Blumenauer from the Bike Caucus. Thank you, Sharon. Please continue. Okay. Um, so uh, I talked about here the, the major hybrid road of mountain. Those are like the classic um, non-assisted bikes, but uh, anything that other type of bike also has, is, has been introduced with a motor. Here, I've got a picture of a trike. And this is um, my attempt at a cruiser. And this is a folding bike. Um, down here, this is a cargo bike. Um, here's a recumbent with a motor. And this one, I've seen quite a few of these on the city. Uh, it's, it's, it's got a fat tire. Uh, it's kind of, they call it a, a motor. Um, uh, it's, it looks like a motorcycle, but it's, it's actually, um, you know, has a battery and a motor. It's got all the components. It's technically, by definition, legally, it's a, it's a bike. And we did have a question of whether there were recumbent e-bikes. So you just yeah, answered is. that for her. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the three parts that are unique to an e-bike. Uh, the first is the motor. And there's two basic types of motors. There's some differences. I'll talk, talk about that later. But the first basic difference is um, this, but here's a picture of um, a mid-drive motor. It places the weight of the motor in the center of the bike. Um, and the advantage is that improves stability because this additional weight is in the middle of the bike. Uh, the motor here is works with gears, increasing overall efficiently, efficiency. The bike frame has to be designed to have the motor in the bottom bracket, however. And it might be less powerful assist and require the rider to do a little more work. Um, so just from personal experience, I find that the mid-drive motor is a more natural feel um, it, as compared to a regular bike. It feels pretty much the same. But the other type of motor is the hub drive. And a hub drive, the, the motor in the wheel is less complex. And so therefore it's less expensive to have an e-bike with the motor um, in the hub drive in the rear wheel. Um, it is more difficult to fix a flat true wheel and adjust the brakes because uh, there's a lot of stuff going on back here. Um, but it does allow retrofitting an existing bike. Um, it is technically um, more efficient at delivering power because it's pushing the bike as opposed to using the, mid, the gears in the middle. And it's half the weight of a mid-drive. The other um, unique part of an e-bike compared to a regular non-assisted bike is the battery. And it can be uh, um, integrated in the frame like this picture here on the top or it could be strapped on um, a rear rack or you know, mounted someplace else. These are the two most common places you would find the battery added. Mountain bikes tend to have larger batteries because they're using more power to get up to deal with the steep and technical terrain. And it is possible to have two batteries on your e-bike. Um, you, you should um, look for one that's easily removed if you're not able to charge the bike where you're stored. If you store your bike in a bike room and there's no power there, then you need to be able to remove the battery and take it inside and, and charge it. Usually takes from six to eight hours to fully charge. And a range is typically 25 to 50 miles. And people always ask, how far can you get on this, um, on, on, a bat, on a charge, 100% charge when you're going out? Uh, how, how many miles can you go? And the answer is, it depends. Um, it depends on the temperature of the air, the rider weight, the wind resistance, the elevation you're riding at, the tire pressure, 
And the biggest one though, that you can control is the amount of assistance use. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And the third part that's unique to an e-bike is the display. And this display turns the motor and the battery on or off. Um, you can allows you to select the various assisted assist levels, and they typically range from one to nine. Um, and it displays the active battery level. You can see here this should, this is a fully charged battery here on the lower left with all these dots here. And you also usually if there are built-in lights, which most e-bikes e have, it allows you to activate the lights. And here I have a little chart. Bosch is a pretty big player in the e-bike space. And their, um, their displays and, and motors and batteries typically support um, uh, these four modes. And the first is that you can, you can operate your bike without any assist. So just turn the battery and the motor off. And, um, the, and you can just um, operate it like a regular bike. Um, the problem is that it's heavy. And so you'll have to do a little extra work. Uh, but that's what if you uh, should run out of battery and you just have to pedal it on your own, um, you just you can do that. You can just pedal it. Uh, echo mode is 40 percent. And usually that is enough assist to make up for the additional weight of the additional uh, e-bike components, the battery, the, uh, the battery, the motor and the display. And then tour mode is 100 um, percent. And then uh, Bosch calls it the support mode, which provides 150 percent of the assist. And turbo is 225%. And as you go, as the use higher support assist levels, you're using up more battery and that will um, make your range shorter. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, the e-bike legal status. So for a long time, e-bikes were in legal limbo. Are they bicycles? Are they motor vehicles? Are they mopeds, electric motorcycles? You know, what do we consider these? And so right now, half the states have adopted a system of three classes, uh, but it could by um, the states have adopted it, but some municipalities may have um, different regulations. So this chart um, map shows how e-bikes are interpreted in each state's vehicle codes for use on road, bike lanes, and bike paths. And the vehicle code does not generally apply to state or local land management agencies who manage electric mountain bike access, our motorized and non-motorized trails typically used for hiking or biking. So you'll see that uh, Illinois, it has adopted what the people for bikes considers their model legislation. And that means um, it defines, um, the, the model legislation includes um, the defining e-bike, breaking e-bikes into three different classes. They're regulated as bicycles, um, pass, um, but there, there's some states that the, the, the yellow or the orange here um, have some problematic um, features of their, their e-bike regulation code. Um, and then there's the problematic ones, which the um, People for Bikes is working with because the e-bikes in, in these states that are red um, may be regulated as moped or motor vehicles, uh, confusing equipment and use requirements, licensing and registration and confusing access to bike infrastructure. So trying to get that all cleaned up to be um, the model legislation whenever possible. So in Illinois, uh, the throttles, um, let's see, let's see, or this, I don't want to talk about the three classes. So here's the three classes that the People for Bikes has introduced. And so any e-bikes that you would ride or that you would purchase, you'd want to ask what, what class is this e-bike? And so the class one is an e-bike equipped with a motor that provides assistance only when the rider is pedaling and the maximum speed on a class one bike is 20 miles an hour. And the class two bike is an e-bike equipped with a throttle actuated motor that ceases pro to propel the bike when it reaches 20 miles an hour. So a throttle means the bike uh, operates without pedaling. You just activate the throttle and you move forward um, without having to pedal. And a class three e-bike is equipped, equipped uh, either with a throttle or not, uh, it depends on the definition, and it goes up to 28 miles an hour. Now in Illinois, throttles are not allowed on class, e class three e-bikes. Um, they're not subject to registration, licensing, or insurance requirements that would apply to motor vehicles. Persons under 16 years of age may not ride a class three e-bike. That's the 28 miles per hour one. Uh, there's no riding on sidewalks, but that's usually the case of all bikes. They are allowed on bike paths um, unless restricted locally. 
And in Chicago, the class three, the 28 mile per hour bikes are not allowed in bike lanes, but they are street legal and they're allowed in road lanes. They are allowed to share the lane with, a, with an auto. So they are allowed on the 606 trail. They are allowed on the lakefront path and they are allowed in Cook County Forest Preserves. Um, the class, um, class one and two, um, up to 20 miles per hour. So one question that um, often comes up, I had someone in the shop today, I was, uh, mentioned the e-bikes and they go, oh, that's not for me, they're cheating. Um, and the, there's been quite a bit of literature about the cheating uh, issue. Um, the counterintuitive nature of e-bikes, a growing exercise resource, a new study finds e-bike riders quadrupled their cycling distance over a six month period. It's a Norwegian study. Um, and there's a body of research that's spelling e-bikes as cheating the cheating myth grows. Um, so I like to say it's not cheating if you're not competing. So um, studies have shown over at University of Zurich, Brigham Young, Hanover Medical Schools, uh, the result of the various studies in the literature shows that e-bike users take more and longer trips. The physical activity gains are similar to that of, of regular, of cycling without an assist. Um, they found in one study, they said that um, they studied people that use e-bikes and they got 90% of the same physical, the heart rate benefits as an, a non-assisted rider. Um, and that's within the range of um, considered physical activity. And then and with an e-bike user, car trips are substituted more and more with an e-bike trip. So rather than getting in a car to go one of those short three to five mile trips, um, people might be more inclined to jump on an e-bike because of the you know, it's a less, um, less physical effort, but just as enjoyable to be outdoors. But there are some downsides to e-bikes. One is the cost um, that they, um, they do um, cost more than a non-assisted bike because uh, there is the additional components, the motor, the battery, and the display. Um, they, um, um, the cost, uh, let's see if I have some data here on the cost of the data. Um, usually in the cost area, we're talking about three different types of groupings of e-bikes. One is the, the under, um, the under um, $500, which would be a kit um, up to about, a, about to around $1,000, which would be the mid range. And then, then the high end range is um, 2000 and above. Um, bike, e-bikes are, are way heavier, they weigh more. Um, and, and that's because you've got that battery and that um, uh, motor ad in addition to all the other regular bicycle components. There is a question about safety on the road. Um, there, there was some discussion I read about are e-bikes more dangerous than motorcycles? And there was a feeling that they were. Um, it's because um, that uh, any, any type of a uh, vehicle that's in the traffic lane that's slower than regular traffic always is at risk of be re being rear-ended or passed or uh, being passed with a, a narrow um, uh, um, foot distance. Um, uh, E-bike users are not as geared up as a motorcycle a rider. You see those people with their leather clothing and all that stuff. Um, you don't see that when you, you, people are wearing their street clothes when they're riding an e-bike. Um, and less sophisticated parts on an e-bike and rider education. People on motorcycles, you know, they have to be licensed and have insurance. And so they have to go to classes. And so there's better education. So there is a um, possibility that uh, you've got these additional speeds, but there might be some safety issues if people are not properly taking proper precaution. Uh, storage, you need to store your e-bike, not only, um, because of theft, um, you need to have a safe place to store it, but you need to charge that battery. And, um, and so either, like I said before, you either have to, if your storage place you restore your bike does not have a, a, an outlet and it is charged just with a regular outlet. Um, you plug it in, it costs just pennies to, to charge up, um, but then you have to be able to remove the battery. So you need to make a plan for where you're gonna store your e-bike and how you're gonna charge the battery. And battery management requires um, use as well. Like I said, if you, um, if you go on a 55 mile trip and then you run out of batteries, then um, you, know, you might, because you're using too big of a, um, you're too, using too much of a cyst or it's too windy, um, that you would um, find that you'll have to bike home with this heavy bike um, uh, 
uh, without any assist. So it requires some ma um, management. You have to be careful to say, um, and, and there are some various uh, phone apps now with some of the uh, bikes that are uh, provide a, a estimated range. At your current rate, you know, you can go 20 more miles at this assist level. You know, so there's some software algorithms that help you help you manage your battery while you're on the road. There is rapid innovation. It's sort of like the early days of computers. You know, you were hate to buy yourself a computer because um, in a few months, something better and cheaper is being introduced. And that's certainly the case with e-bikes, always something new coming out. And uh, some people, there's us thinking, why do people hate you? Because you're passing them with less effort on the road. <laughs> um, so that's so a dump. Sharon, uh, there's been several questions. Most we'll get to at the end, but somebody asked if you could repeat the price ranges again. So I figured while you had that sheet of paper out. Um, yeah, so let's see. Um, I have that in front of me. I know I wrote a blog about this, I think. So it, I think it was under $500 is those kits. Uh, uh, maybe under $1,000 would be um, the, the low end. Um, and then the 1,000 to 2,000 is the mid range. And then the uh, above 2,000 is the, is the more premium range of, of um, the e-bikes. And I know there's been several questions, but I know some of them she's gotten to as we've gone through. So I figure Sharon will wait till you're done and then I'll make sure you're aware of all the questions. Okay, great. Okay, so let's see, we talked about, um, we talked about, oh, okay, I'm going, going the wrong way here. Okay, so I talked about e-bikes 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, when I'm saying right now we're in kind of 3.0. So what's the future of e-bikes? And so uh, there's new materials being introduced all the time, developed, which will re uh, result in weight reduction. But as you know, um, with traditional bikes, is that weight reduction usually results in a higher cost. The more exotic materials, a fine, fine, more finely engineered. Um, so uh, there are some e-bikes that are becoming um, much lighter weight. And, and there's also new uses for what to do with the battery. And so um, some of the things that are being used with the battery, since you've now got power on your bike that a traditional bike doesn't have is a lighting. And most of the e-bikes that I'm familiar with have built-in front and rear lights. Some of them are activated with the brakes, um, sort of like in a car, uh, e-shifting. Um, health monitoring and um, security, you know, like a GPS system. And I've got some examples of some of these new type of e-bikes that um, I've kind of introduced that I've been following. Um, this GREPS G6.2, whatever, um, is has built-in electronics. And so I, I'm highlighting this one because it has a T-Mobile eSIM card inside the frame. And it's in, has integrated video cameras, both front and rear. I think it, the front one is here and the rear one you can see right over here. It works um, that it has a, um, it's controlled by a, a phone app. Um, it um, adjusts auto assist mode and gathers information for those battery range predictions I mentioned before so that you uh, keep aware of uh, where your battery sits so where you can um, not plan not to run out. Um, it has a remote lock with a phrase, uh, geolocation, GPS, accelerometer, and a barometer. And you can play the game of TREP. That means you can ride along with others, um, not alongside, but um, at different times and sort of like a video game, you know, that you can control your performance, sort of like Strava. Um, it's built into this app. Um, and this bike costs um, $8,500. $8, Here's another interesting bike that I came across. This is a Super Strata and it's 3D printed. Um, it's a, a, it's a Silicon, Silicon Valley company, um, composite manufacturer, unibody, carbon frame, 3D printing, no glues, no joints, no seams. It has a slim E2 battery right here in the down tube. Um, and it's customizable, obviously, because they're making it just for you. There's dozens of colors and styles, $2,800. This Knox one is kind of interesting, two bikes and one motor. So let's say that you um, uh, commute during the week to your, to your work, and then on the weekends, you like to go shred it on a mountain bike. And you're not gonna be doing using those two bikes at the same time. So why have a separate bike just sitting in the garage not being used? So this is a German company, Knox Cycles. They make a commuter and mountain bike that uses a swappable 
mid-motor, the Faza Evasion, which is also a German company. So it's got a 252 watt battery and a 240 watt motor. Uh, all the heavy hardware bits are right here in this tube and um, the bottom bracket torque cater sensors permanently mounted to the bike. So the bike can be ridden without assist and that means it's lighter, but then if you push in the battery, um, then you have the assist and it saves having to buy two separate motors and batteries when you're only going to ride one bike at a time. But these are high-end bikes, carbon fiber frames, costing 11,000 to 13,000 each in a bundle. So you save about $1,200 over buying two separate bikes. This is the clip. It's, it allows you to retrofit an existing bike. Um, it houses the motor and the battery in this little um, a, a device that attaches to the fork um, and the front wheel in a matter of seconds. Tiny controller attaches to the handlebars to boost your bike. It's designed for commuting. So you can take it off when you ride at your destination, fits in your backpack and you can charge it at your desk and then recharge it for the ride home. So it weighs seven pounds. Uh, maximum speed is 15 miles an hour. Um, the range is 10 to 15 miles, which is about a 45 minute commute. Charging time is 40 minutes. Um, and the price is $400. The City Q protects riders from the elements. I mean, do you like to bike, but sometimes you just sometimes can't handle the weather? Well, or you wanna carry more or bike year round? Um, with the City Q, um, it's designed to make cycling comfortable and independent of weather, car traffic, and parking regulations. Uh, this was created by a Norwegian company. Uh, it's pedaled like a bike, 250 watt motor, uh, which augments, which is an assist. Um, uh, pedals aren't linked to the drivetrain. Um, it's described as a software managed drivetrain, like you would find an electric car. Um, so because it's an assist, instead of just, um, it, the battery um, it still needs to be charged. There's a battery in case of a, a five hour charge, uh, vehicles, two batteries said to good for a range of 43 to 62 miles. Um, it's got a windshield, doors, side doors, help protect it from the wind and the rain. Cabin can be configured to either sit two adults side by side or one by, no, two adults, one behind another, one adult and two children or one adult in extra cargo spaces. Um, so this one costs, um, it's available for pre-order on the company's website um, sometime this year and it's priced about $9,000. Uh, because they said it's a, it, it legally required, it's legally defined as an e-bike. So that means it can be driven in bike lanes and other car-free areas, and it doesn't require a driver's license. All right, this one is the Le Mans prologue. I'm just fascinated with this one. Greg Le Mans, you recall, uh, he closed his bike business in 2016 in order to focus all his efforts on his manufacturing process. And so he's into carbon fiber. So now he's in, back into producing products and He's got um, a manufacturing plant in Tennessee. I think it's Knoxville, Tennessee, um, and where he manufactures carbon for not only bikes, but for other industries as well. And this bike, which he calls the Prologue, it's kind of like a, he, it's his version of a hybrid. It's carbon fiber everywhere. The, the frame, the fork, the fenders, the seat post, the one piece handlebar stem. This is the stem and the handlebars is, is one piece. Um, the wheels, it's got a smaller, uh, motor and a 36 volt Panasonic battery integrated in the frame that must be right here. Um, and I think the motor is in the is in the rear. Um, it includes always on set of front and rear LED lights, disc brake, Shimano DI2 shifting. It weighs 26 pounds. And so I said, um, there's always exceptions, people trying to reduce the weight. Um, and the range is up to 46 miles per hour on the lowest setting. Here, here this is Greg himself writing it. Uh, they claim, he says that he's going to, this is his first introduction. He's working on a Dutch style um, e-bike. And then uh, next year he's planning to come up with some road bikes. The cowboy, if Tesla or Apple made an e-bike, it would look like this. It's a Belgium company. It's got a carbon belt, a lights in the frame that you turn on with a tap, flashing brake lights, phone app unlocks and it has crash detection. Um, a uh, navigation feature is the breezometer, um, the same company that supplies air quality data to the Apple Weather app. Um, it's a design, it allows the, um, the Cowboy app to design a route um, using their localized air quality data and direct riders to the cleanest routes to get them to their destination. Is that cool or what? Weighs 37 pounds, has a range of 43 miles. 
and it costs twenty eight hundred dollars, but it's not available in the U.S. yet. So, Sharon, you were talking about the Le Monde. Um, did you mention the price of that one? Yeah, it was um, forty five hundred. And again, I know a lot of you guys have questions. We will um, pepper her with all of them when she's complete. Okay, um, Harley Davidson. Uh, the internet blew up last year, last September, when Harley Davidson uh, announced that they were getting into the e-bike business. And so uh, since then, uh, other e-automobile e manufacturers like Porsche have also announced e-bikes, um, but uh, they, they came up with this, um, this design on the left, which is proposed, which was, um, by all accounts, gorgeous, uh, deep black gloss, lacquer paint job, like the first 1903 Harley Davidson Serial One motor, uh, motorbike. Harley Davidson spun off a separate company in um, Colorado, I think, and they're calling the company Serial One after the, the, not, the name of the first Harley Davidson bike back at the turn of the century. Um, it has brass touches on this bike, uh, polished chrome crankset, uh, brilliant white tires, warm chestnut brown grips, and a Brooks run ladder saddle. But then in January, they released the specs of the actual bike, uh, the Mosh City, uh, which is on the right, and it's not as exciting. Um, it's um, a class one, uh, it means it only goes 20 miles an hour, um, pedal assist, uh, bros, mid-drive, carbon fiber belt, single speed, it's a single speed, this one. Um, they also have another version which has um, um, some gears into it, um, and it's a hybrid comfort bike aimed at the young urban professional. But the talk is that um, it's going to be hard to get enough of those uh, latte-loving crowds into a Harley dealership to buy one of these things. Um, they also, like I said, have the Rust City, for, um, which has got some gears. Um, so this one is the single speed. Uh, Mosh City is $33.99. And the Rust City, which is the same bike, but with a derailleur with a seven speed internal hub. It's got internal hub. Fender, oh, it's got Fender's rack um, and lockable glove box is uh, $43.99. This one, um, I had to had really zoom into this, like how can they do this? Uh, hubless e-bike uh, available for pre-order uh, at the moment. It's aluminum frame, one-sided fork, uh, hubless 27 and a half inch wheels, 250 watt motor, re removable battery charges in three hours, a range of 37 miles. Uh, top speed of 25 miles per hour, which means it's, it's like a class one. Um, the US version is a, has a more powerful motor, a maintenance-free drivetrain. It's enclosed in here, um, operates with your phone on a cradle and includes a GPS tracker, motion sensor, wheel lock, bio, biometric authentication, um, USB charging point, invisible kickstand, $2,300. So being the host, I'm going to added my own little question. You said it took you forever to figure out how that worked with the hub listing. So yeah. before you go on, can you give us a very brief thing of how that works? Yeah, so right here where I'm pointing is um, where the wheel turns. So it's got a rotation right here. Instead of in the hub like we're used to, it just works right here. Um, so it rotates on this device here and it's single-sided fork. Same thing here. It's the, it rotates right here in the back on this thing. Thank you. That is so intriguing. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> um, this one, uh, the Kate Cock, it's a solar power, powered bike. This is kind of weird because it's an electric bush bike for Africa to support anti-poaching. Uh, uses the sun energy to charge. Uh, so three hours maximum range, three mi riding modes. And I think this is really cool. You, I, you sh I showed you those modes before, you know, the turbo or something. Here they call it the Explore, the Excite, and the Excel. Those are the three modes. Um, it's sold as a combo so that each one you purchase is a bundle of two bikes, a solar powered station and solar, solar panels. So the buyer gets one bike and the other twin bike is donated to the so Southern Africa Wildlife College. Um, so and if this is not really a bike, but um, in the, in the bike packing uh, is being more popular. So some people are looking for a more comfortable version. So if you have an e-bike, you can pull a trailer that's big. Um, so this one is um, the Moody Teardrop Trailer from Moody Plast. It's made from carbon fiber and fiberglass, weighs less than 100 pounds, sleeps one, available in three models from $6,000 to $9,000. 
Um, this is just a little bit about bike parking. This is made in Belgium. Um, so, um, you know, before that, you need a place to uh, park, park your bike and charge it. And, and so these stations here um, allows a rider to simply pull into an open slot, like the, lock the bike, place it in without having to lift the bike or worry about dropping it while you're fumbling with the lock. Um, there's, um, there's a strip of wood here, so it's beautiful to look at. And it can be wired into the electric grid so you can get your, um, your bike charged while you're parked. This one is based in uh, Paris, um, emergency bike. This is a big, uh, an e-bike powered by a Bosch mid-drive motor. Um, they say that in an emergency situation, every minute lost equals 10% lunch chance of survival. So this is a mobility solution, allows uh, um, a medical worker to get to an accident scene well, without being stuck in traffic. Uh, they've partnered with a French e-mobility company um, and it uses, um, uh, it, it's not designed, it's, it's designed to get a, a, a healthcare worker to an emergency situation to stabilize any injured people so that an ambulance can follow behind. Okay, so those are my examples of um, some interesting e-bikes that are being um, introduced now. So I have a little quick uh, self-test here. Um, if a bike with a motor is called an electric bike, what would you call a bike without one, without a motor? The correct answer is all of the above. Um, I guess I, I could have made that a, a poll for you. So we'll know that for next time. Yeah, so um, the, we're, we're always struggling to say, well, you know, we know what an e-bike is, uh, well, what we're calling an e-bike, but okay, what do you call those regular bikes that we're, you know, that don't have the motor? So in some cases, um, I've heard it say non-assisted, non-motorized and um, analog um, as opposed to electric. And then this was in those a rock band uh, uh, issue, um, acoustic versus electric. Um, here's another one. How much do most common e-bikes weigh today? I gave you some examples of some lightweight ones, but uh, the most typical e-bikes today are about 40 to 55 pounds. And then one last question here, will rain impact the electronics on an e-bike? A, all the electronics are sealed and splash proof. But if your bike is on the, in the rain, you should put the battery inside the car. B, the electronics are waterproof and you can ride the bike into a lake. Or C, a drop of water will short at the motor. And the correct answer is A, it's sealed, um, but you should um, just try to avoid the rain and put the battery in the car. Okay, so that's it. Um, if superheroes couldn't find the right e-bike, um, I, I have, um, I follow, I get this information because I have a Google e-bikes alert. So I read about e-bikes every day and I follow up and research things. And I do blog about e-bikes a lot, not every week, but I have a lot of information in my website on the Learning Center about e-bikes. Um, so if you are interested in a little more detail about the motors and the motors, pros and cons of mid-drive, high-drive dri batteries and displays, I've got some more detailed information there. So you have a lot of questions. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, so we will get through as many as possible. I'm gonna combine two of them because we had two questions about the classes. So um, both class three, if they're allowed on Chicago bike pass and if class one, if they're, they're not allowed in sidewalks anywhere in Illinois or just certain places. So I thought I would group those two together for you. Yeah, so class three means 28 miles an hour and they are not allowed on the bike paths. So the issue is, well, how, did, how does that enforce and enforce? I think it's a matter of etiquette that you don't wanna be buzzing other users that are on the trail. And so uh, that's the reason why um, they say it's a 20 mile per hour maximum on the bike paths, uh, 606, the lakefront, and even in the striped bike lanes in the city. It, class one and class two, that means with the throttle up to 20 miles an hour is allowed, but um, uh, you're not supposed to go more than 20 miles an hour in a bike facility in Illinois. And the class one, um, what was that question? Um, you know, uh, about most sidewalks. Bikes, yeah, most bikes aren't, in most municipalities, including Chicago, bikes aren't allowed on the sidewalks. And so that's the same with the e-bike. And I think that does differ a bit depending on where you are. So if you're 
you are curious in your particular location, I would ask. Um, right, so there were a couple different questions too about batteries. So let me give you those two at once. Um, I think one was just more in general about the how long the any idea on life of battery for different style systems and then somebody else asked particularly about the Bosch one and if that range diminishes significantly over the years. Yeah, it does. Um, there's some battery management that you need to do and that's one of the downsides of an of a e-bike. It's another thing you need to deal with is your battery. You need to figure out oh, I rode all day. So if I want to ride again tomorrow, I better remember to charge it, plug it in. Um, and it, so a battery typically lasts about 500 charges. So, um, you know, maybe if you know, use it every few days, you know, two to three years. And then as the battery gets older, it does diminish and it holds a charge less longer. Um, at a certain point, um, after a few years, you'll have to, you know, if you use your bike a lot, you'll need to replace the battery and you could buy replacement batteries, but there is the most expensive component of the bike right now, the lithium iron batteries, they cost about seven to seven hundred, eight hundred dollars And then I'm going to group a, a couple, we had several about buying e-bikes, so some wanted to know what the inventory looks like for e-bikes in 2021, but we also had your um, your opinion on online retail with no brick and mortar stores, yes, um, yes. as well as what type of e-bikes you sell. Yeah, so um, uh, there's shortages of e-bikes just like in everything um, because they are so popular. Um, and so the supply and demand. So there are some shortages of e-bikes. And, um, and so that was one question uh, online. Yeah, um, so that's a sore point uh, with me um, as a brick and mortar retailer. Uh, I don't understand how anyone can buy a bike on the internet, but the market has spoken. And so people are buying bikes all the time on the internet. And um, the largest, uh, the, most of the e-bikes in the United States are being sold uh, via the internet. And there's some big players in there. Uh, one of them just had a, um, a raised a round of capital. They raised $130 million and, um, and to uh, expand their fleet of support because they're internet only business right now. And I can tell you that when people call my shop and um, ask if we do um, uh, e-bike service and we do, you know, we sell service and sell e-bikes, but I asked them what the brand is. And if it's a brand I'm not familiar with, I mentioned before that I, I found 241 different brands of e-bikes. So they mentioned a brand. Sometimes I've heard of the brand, sometimes I haven't. And, and about most of the time, I just refuse it because I don't know anything about it. And so it's just like any other, um, there's, look, there's some specific things about e-bikes that, you know, a bike is a bike. And sometimes, you know, you encounter um, you know, some vintage parts or some new technology, you know, that we haven't seen before, and we can usually figure it out. But that's not the case with the motors. Um, if they have some cheap motors that uh, if they're poorly designed, where you have to take the whole wheel off in order to adjust the disc brake, I mean, that is ridiculous. And so I just don't want to go into those type of things. So I think, um, the biggest thing, you can get e-bikes on the internet and they sound attractive. They have no shipping. Uh, they claim they offer, um, they have offered warranty and they offer phone support. But I'm telling you, if anything goes wrong and you need some someone to physical look at it, uh, it is hard to find someone to maintain, um, to support, maintain and support a bike. Um, and, and, it, and this is the case also, um, uh, I sell some bikes that are um, also available on the internet. And when they come to me, uh, our shop, I take them out of the box and unpack them and inspect it. And then I usually spend 30 to 40 minutes truing the wheels, adjusting the headset, putting the brakes in straight. So they, I mean, uh, I don't understand how a consumer has the skill to do that type of thing. So um, that's just my own personal opinion because I, just what I've seen um, that a consumer would get this bike, pull it out of the box, turn the handlebars and start riding it. Yeah, but it's not it's not optimized, you know, the wheels are out of true, you know, and the uh, average consumer doesn't know how to do that. So, um, but I know, like I said, the market has spoken, <laughs> people do it. So um, you, the biggest selection, 
of um, yeah. And so that's my big my and big speech about advice. There was said, along those lines too that somebody else mentioned they read an article where they talked about what you just mentioned that bike shops unable or unwilling to service e-bikes that are not dealers for, um, right. which you just went and they said uh, has to do with liability problems requiring parts. So do you see this changing or reducing adoption of e-bikes if there's so many being bought online that can't be serviced or that it's yeah. harder to find a place to service them? Well, you know, they're very popular in Europe and they're being sold out of brick and mortars there. And so I think it's just, um, um, it's just the, the way the market is, is the market has spoken here in the United States. Um, it remains to be seen how that um, happens. Um, the, the, the brand that I carry, my smart plug is I carry the Magnum. I carry Magnum bikes and I can get their bikes and, and I will service and support those because I get parts from the manufacturer. I've had, I've had training and I know how to support them. So uh, I will definitely support that brand. Um, other bikes, occasionally I'll repair a flat on a bike, um, but other times, like I said, it's, um, there's proprietary software um, there's no diagnostic tools. People say their motor turns out in a shorts. Well, um, the, the brand that I work with, we plug our computer in, we get diagnostics, we can isolate the problem, whether it's a battery problem or whether it's a motor problem. If it's under warranty, they ship us a new piece. Um, and if it's not under warranty, then we can buy that part for the consumer, you know, if it's an older device. So, um, yeah. And then I'm going to switch. I know we're starting to run short on time. I'm going to switch modes a little bit. So um, Ralph had asked, what are typical user errors? And then we had somebody else that also asked, and now I can't find it because we have so many wonderful comments and questions. Um, but somebody else talked about the concerns about being on a trail with an, with an e-bike. So if you could touch on both, if there's special concerns you have to worry about on on trails with e-bikes, as well as since there seems to be a lot of people that would be new to this, um, what are some errors that they should know about so they can avoid? Like, yeah, I think um, I mean etiquette is 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 the same on a bike or an e on an acoustic bike and an e-bike that you uh, want to pass people and signal your intentions and um, ride safely and be predictable. Uh, it's the same thing. It's um, and, and you don't want to be whizzing by people at uh, 28 miles an hour and scaring them. Um, so I think um, that's, the, I think, I, I don't know of any place in the Chicago area where e-bikes are not allowed as long as you're um, uh, share the road um, politely. Um, and there are some, there's a lot of controversy, of course, in other parts of the country. Um, uh, Miami Beach, you know, they weren't, uh, should e-bikes be allowed on the boardwalk? Um, and, um, and in the, the federal lands, you know, about mountain biking, a lot of discussion, and it's up to each property owner to decide whether e-bikes are be allowed. But, but um, in a lot of those public lands, you know, there was the whole whether mountain bikes should be allowed on those trails as well. And so, um, so I think as they, as they become more popular, um, people are, cons uh, the man land managers, trail managers are are dealing with the issues, what's best for their community. So it would depend, I think, on each one. And, and if you're an e-bike user, you just need to be a good citizen and just like on um, um, any other cyclist. And I have to give a shout out. I'm not surprised that one of our board members, Cynthia Hoyle, is um, attending this webinar because I see all of her posts about her e-bike and she did Say that after she got her e-bike, most of her trips were via bike. And last month, she biked 211 miles and drove six miles. So that's there you go. Yes, awesome. replace a car trip with an e-bike trip. Yeah, good for the environment, good for your health, getting more exercise. So who says that's cheating, right? <laughs> so I know we're at eight o'clock. Are you on a hard stop, Sharon, or do you? No, have... I'm available. Yeah. Okay, let me see. So. There was um, one of the bikes you mentioned, there was a specific question. So the one that the motor attaches, I think it was called the clip. Yes. Attached to the front of the bike. Um, there were some questions about how it attaches. I don't know if you know anything more about that one. And 
Um, maybe if we don't get to the rest of these, we can try to do um, a follow up maybe on our website or our Facebook page because yeah, sure. this is obviously a very popular topic with people because we have a lot more questions than normal. Okay, yeah, um, I guess I would, I'd have to look into it some more. I just saw the clip, I thought it was interesting. Um, um, maybe a future blog topic yeah, for us. Yeah, right, sounds that good. Um, you know, most of the, when I talked about the motors being in the mid drive or the rear hub, which makes more sense um, engineer mechanically, the clip is a, a front one. So it's pulling the front wheel. So it's a different feel. So um, it, it, even though it's reasonable, only $400 and it gives you that uh, uh, 10 to 15 mile range, it sounds like it's a, it's a good thing to do um, as, as a starter or to try it out. It's not a big investment but I can imagine it would have a different feel, you know, to be pulled as opposed to um, what we're used to as cyclists, you know, the pedaling. Um, Mark did all... point out um, batteries should be removed when transporting. Mm -hmm. Oh, Cynthia and Champaign, Urbana anyways, bikes are allowed in the city on the sidewalks. Um, Elizabeth wanted to know, uh, do any e-bikes use batteries other than lithium? ion and do you find such batteries to be less than environmentally friendly are batteries and motors fairly standardized at this point yeah in the most popular ones right now are the lithium ones there's some nikad ones um, from a first generation uh, but most of them are um, uh, pretty the lithium ion batteries um, that there was some big innovations about 10 years ago with more battery power in a shorter space. And, but um, I've heard someone talk, say that they think that the battery is pretty much maxed out. So there might be something new, you know, that people are looking at um, the, a different technology. So, I mean, who knows? I said that there's always the, in this field, there's a rapid innovation. So there's people looking at, but I haven't heard any specifically prototypes being announced with any other battery except lithium ion at this time. And along those lines, Ken wanted to know if you have any predictions on what we can expect in the next three years, such as trends, tech gains, public charging. Um, you know, infrastructure, you know, is always difficult, but we'll see uh, with the Biden administration how much money they're willing to invest in bike and pedestrian infrastructure. And um, if there, if any of it is, um, you know, uh, uh, accommodates electric vehicles, and there, as there are people like People for Bikes, which are actively lobbying for e-bikes infrastructure in this country, and so they're working um, with those, um, you know, with the Washington crowd to uh, try to get that stuff. So I think um, that the I think bikes are become going to become lighter, and e-bikes are going to become lighter, and uh, with more options, and um, we're finding lots of new ways to use that battery power. Uh, I mentioned that grip bike, you know, that had the built-in SIM card. I mean, that's pretty amazing, right? Constantly connected with, with um, video cameras and um, your, um, yeah, GPS, uh, help heart rate monitoring. So, um, yeah, I think I think we're just at the beginning of figuring out what to do with the Bluetooth technology and apps and the battery on the bike. And then I think we're gonna let you out here too, but we did, somebody did ask um, what type of, about e-bikes and brands so locally, but of course, I'm not quite sure where Eileen is at. So why don't you tell us some about the ones, I think you already did the ones you saw locally. And then I am gonna point out, um, there is a lot more bike shops that are having e-bikes and we do have a list um, by towns of all the bike shops on our webpage under resources. And then if you go to our um, bike friendly Illinois map, you can also just click on bike shops. So it's possible the closest one to you will not have e-bikes, but a lot more are, are starting to now. Yeah, the big brands, uh, Trek Specialized Giant, all have e-bikes. Um, they are uh, higher priced ones, you know, 4,000 and up. Um, and they're more, um, um, you know, use premium components, a little lighter, more powerful, that type of thing. Um, and um, 
the brand that I carry, Jameis, does not offer an e-bike, so that's why I went to another brand, the Magnum brand. Um, but there are other, um, yeah, if you check with your local bike shop, they may have um, picked up some, some brands. I think I was looking at, um, there was one brand I was kind of interested in, the, Go, the GoPro, Go, what's it called again? Um, and I Googled there, and there were several dealers in the, in the Chicago area, mostly in the suburbs. But um, so, yeah, check with your local bike shop what, what e-bike brands they carry, if any. And do you rent them? Like, I have a feeling yes. there's going to be... Okay, so people that have just heard your webinar and want to go try out an e-bike, they can rent one from you. And I would, you know, if you're not in her area, um, I would, you know, reach out to your own local shop as well. Okay, so we are sorry that we did not get to all of your questions, um, but we have run over. So we will save the chat. So we can try to do some, some follow-up. We've also had some suggestions of maybe you doing another webinar for us on some more like tips on how to like break and accelerate and maybe a follow-up session on e-bikes. So we'll pitch those to you at another time. Oh, and there's a shop, uh, Quad Cities, Mark Hendricks said that his uh, shop also rents. So thank you all so very, very much for attending. Like I said, this, We'll, we will have the recording up on our YouTube channel, possibly tomorrow uh, by the end of the weekend at the very latest. So you can watch it again. You can share it with your friends. And we hope that you all have a wonderful evening. Thanks, everyone. Hey, I am going to end this now. Good night, everybody.